This is a pie, casserole, whatever you want to call it. It's the thing that I make with my Thanksgiving leftovers. It's easy, it's cheap, it feeds a ton of people, and a ton of different things can go in it, whatever you have. But you'll probably start with some leftover meat. Could be chicken, but here's my turkey. I don't stress about carving every last bit of meat off of my turkey because after dinner, I can just use my fingers to tear out every hard-to-access scrap of meat. Ooh, there's the oyster. I think turkey wings are really stringy and sinewy, so I don't even carve them off. I just use my fingers to kind of slide the edible meat off of the grossness, which is really easy. There's some leftover breast slices, so that's maybe eight or ten cups of leftover meat. In the fridge it goes. You'll need mashed potatoes to make this. You could use leftover mash, but you need a lot, so either you need to make extra mash in anticipation of the pie, or just start from scratch, which is what I'm doing. I'm peeling a five-pound sack of Yukon Gold potatoes. Yellow-skinned varieties generally have the ideal starch composition for mash. They'll whip up smooth, but they won't get gluey. I'm just cutting them up into smaller pieces so they'll cook quickly and evenly. Into the boiling water they go. Some people say you have to salt the water. That makes no sense at all. This is going to be a homogenous mixture at the end. The salt can go in at any time, and if you wait until the end, you can taste to make sure that you like the amount. After maybe 15 minutes, you can feel they're soft enough to be easily crushed. Drain them off, and into the still hot pot goes eight ounces, that's two sticks of butter. And I like European-style butter for mash. It's slightly fermented, it's got that cheesy, yogurty note that I think really livens up mash. Doesn't have to be fully melted, because we're gonna throw several pounds of piping hot potatoes on it. That'll melt her for sure, also the camera. So I make mash lots of ways. Sometimes I use garlic, sometimes I use a mixture of different potatoes, sometimes I leave the skins on. This is my kind of standard standard holiday mash, which is peeled and whipped smooth. That's how my mom made it growing up, and like I said, the yellow potatoes can take being whipped. They don't turn into glue the way a more waxy potato would. I usually just whip the potatoes with the butter, then I can see how much more moisture it needs. A little bit of milk, and I'll start with a couple of big pinches of salt. Mix that in. Like most starchy things, you want the texture in the pan to be a little looser than what you desire on the plate, because it's going to thicken as it cools. A little more milk in, and now I can have a taste. A little more salt, lots of pepper, and there we go. That is very tasty. This is how I roast vegetables for Thanksgiving, and I would normally do a ton and then use the leftovers for the pie, but right now I'm just making enough to demo the pie. Little bag of Brussels sprouts. You want to start by trimming off the woody stem. Any decaying outer leaves will generally just fall off naturally once you trim off the stem. And then I just cut them in half. Having them helps them to brown a lot better. Peel a bag of carrots, and I like to just roast those whole. I want to keep the piles separate, though, because the sprouts will probably be done before the carrots. A little melted butter on top, salt and pepper, toss everything around, in the oven it goes, 400 Fahrenheit, or honestly whatever temperature I'm roasting the turkey at usually. Give them a little toss for more even browning. Indeed, the sprouts are tender before the carrots, so I'll take those off. Just waiting until the carrots can be pierced with a fork, but they still put up a little bit of a fight. I don't like mushy carrots. Two other things I do right before I make the pie. These are not leftovers. I've got a little bunch of spring onions. Cut off the root ends and then peel off any slimy outer layers before chopping those up. Those will kind of freshen up the pie and intensify the flavor. Then I'll grate up an eight ounce block of sharp cheddar cheese. You can use more cheese, but I like to use it as a subtle flavoring and binding agent. I don't want my pie to be overtly cheesy. All right, time to build the pie. I've got this big six or seven quart enameled cast iron lasagna pan. The wider the pan you've got, the more surface area you're going to have and therefore more browning. A roasting tray would be good too. You could absolutely start this with a butter and flour roux, then mix in your liquid, bring it to a boil, stir in the filling ingredients, and there you go. But I'm going to show you a lighter and much lazier way of thickening and building this. I'll throw my turkey onto a cutting board and just run my knife through it a few times to make sure that everything is bite-sized. Then I'll throw it into the empty, cold pan. Brussels sprouts go in, then I'll cut up my roast carrots into bite-sized pieces too, and those go. And then in go the raw spring onions, and for my first liquid, I will do a 12-ounce bottle of dry, hard apple cider, or as the Brits would call it, cider. You could use white wine, you could use apple juice, maybe just a little bit less juice so it's not too sweet. Then just enough milk to submerge everything. And here comes our light and lazy thickener, Wondra. A lot of people have this around at Thanksgiving anyway because it's good for gravy. It's in the baking aisle at grocery stores. It's a wheat flour formulation that dissolves directly into liquid. It will not form lumps, so you don't need to whisk it into a roux or a slurry or anything like that. Scatter some on to start with, along with a big pinch of salt and some pepper. Then I'm just going to bring this to a boil on the stovetop and mix in more Wondra until I get the thickness that I want. Like normal flour, it won't fully thicken until you bring it to a boil, but be careful about having the heat too high because that can happen. Oh God. 
milk expands massively when it comes to a rolling boil. So do medium, medium high heat, just get it to a vigorous simmer and stir frequently. That helps control the bubbles and also you wanna be careful about this sauce sticking to the bottom and burning. I love thickening this way, either with Wondra or with a cornstarch slurry because there's no guesswork. No guessing how much roux to make up front. No guessing how much sauce you'll need to coat the ingredients of your filling before you put them in. You just submerge everything in liquid, get it bubbling, mix in Wondra until you like the texture. There is a downside though, which is that sauces thickened with this stuff tend to look a little bit grainy. You'll see it more in the finished product. It's purely cosmetic. The sauce tastes smooth, but it doesn't look super nice, which is one reason why everybody doesn't just do this all the time. And that is still not as thick as I want it, but I'll turn the heat off now because it's going to thicken as it cools, and we're going to put in some cheese once it stops boiling. That cheese is going to thicken things up. Got to account for that. Here's our mashed potatoes, and there's two last-minute alterations that'll make this a great pie topping. The first is to put some egg yolks in. I'm going with four. The yolks not only give a delicious, rich flavor, but they also help the mash brown in the oven, and they help it set up firm, more like a biscuit or a dumpling after it's baked. Then I'll also put in a handful of my cheese, for all the same reasons. Now that the filling has cooled down a bit, I'll throw in one or two cups of frozen peas, straight out of the freezer. You do this, that means you delay their cooking, and that ensures that they'll still be reasonably green by the time you eat. Rest of my cheese goes in. If we did this when the sauce was still boiling, it would not melt smooth. It would split and go gritty. Now I can taste this for seasoning. Needs more salt and pepper and some herbs. I'll go with the classic Thanksgiving herbs of dried sage and thyme. Now, if you wanted to spread those potatoes on in a smooth, even layer, edge to edge, over this filling, you would need to chill this filling before topping it. You would need it to set up firm. I have no time for that, and luckily, I don't care. I'm just going to drop big blobs of mash onto the filling like giant dumplings. They're going to sink in a little bit, and you're not going to be able to smooth them out. The filling is too liquid. It would be like sloshing a washcloth around in a bath. I don't care. I think this is going to look and taste just great as is. In the oven it goes at 400 Fahrenheit, and do yourself a favor and stick a baking sheet or a piece of foil under there because that pie is going to boil over, I guarantee it. I'd bake that until you can see the sauce bubbling, 15 or 20 minutes, and then I would turn on the broiler and just brown the topping to my satisfaction. Watch it like a hawk, it'll only take a few minutes and it could burn easy. There we go. I'm sorry, but is that not a thing of beauty? So much better than a sad little turkey sandwich from the fridge. It's the kind of thing that I personally would prefer once it has thoroughly cooled, half an hour or even an hour. When it's just warm, it'll hold together better when you scoop it out. There you go. You can see that kind of grainy appearance that Wondra gives to sauces, especially light-colored sauces. It's purely cosmetic, but if it bothers you, thicken with a roux instead. That is just an insanely hearty meal. It'll stay warm for a long time, and it'll feed all the people you still have milling in and out of your house at the holidays. But don't do it exactly as I did it. Use whatever leftovers you actually have. It's leftovers pie. Don't overthink it.